having my dad over visiting from New Zealand, um, and also being able to celebrate two birthdays. Um, Amara's birthday actually was this last week on Tuesday, and we've got Zaid's birthday tomorrow, um, which is kind of cool, not so much on the bank account, but um, you know, it's always good, and it's good actually having dad here. He goes back on Monday, um, but it's always good doing that. But who's been enjoying the weather? Yeah, it's a bit cold, isn't it? Being in here, you kind of forget how cold it is outside. Um, but at least it's kind of, you know, not as cold today. Um, but having Dad here in this last week, we're out in the garden um, pretty much every day, all day. And so your lips just get really absolutely smashed and everything. But it's really good to be able to get outside and to be able to enjoy it. Does anyone here like sport? I know Nat had a good week on Wednesday night. Um, myself, not so much. But um, when you support Queensland, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But at least the All Blacks beat the English last weekend, so we'll go with that. But look, it's been a good week. There's been a lot of everything going on, but it's great to be able to come here today to just stop and to spend time in God's Word, and especially to be able to come and just sing praises to Him. But look, before we dig into the Word, can we just bow our heads and have a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the week that we've had, the ups, the downs, just everything that we've been through. And we just thank you that you're with us throughout it all. We thank you for bringing us through. We thank you for the new day that we have today, the life you continue to bless us with. And we just pray that every opportunity that we have, that we share the love that we've experienced from you with everyone we come in contact with. Please be with us now, God, as we open your word. Lead us, guide us, and open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, here we are, <clears throat> once again, coming to the Word of God. And we're going to continue our series looking at the S's of Adventism. And this is a series we've been looking through at some key distinctive beliefs, some things that we see a little bit differently to some other Christians, and bringing it back to the Bible and what does the Bible teach us about these topics. But even more importantly, what does the Bible say about Jesus and these topics. Because everything that we believe as a church, we uphold, is centered in Christ. And so in looking at these topics, we've been looking at, well, is that true? And I hope that as we've been going through it, you have experienced that and you've seen that. Today we're looking at our fifth S, which is sadly our last one in this series. But before we get to that, I want to do a quick little recap. So the first one was looking at the Sabbath. It was looking at how Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, how Sabbath is meant to be a blessing. It's meant to be a day that we come and spend with him, spend with our family, and spend with our friends. Secondly, we had a look at the sanctuary and how Jesus is central to the sanctuary. It shows us that he is our high priest, he is our advocate, he is working on our behalf to bring us back to the Father. Thirdly, we dug into the spirit of prophecy, how Jesus has given us that gift how Jesus still wants to speak to us today. The spirit of prophecy isn't just something that was given to us 2,000 years ago. It's not something that was just given to us as a movement 160 years ago. God still speaks to us. Last time we had a look at the state of the dead. We saw how Jesus was the resurrection and the life. He gives us assurance. He gives us hope. Not only of the life to come, but also guidance in the life that we live now. And today we're going to dig into what? The second coming. Now again, just in case you happen to switch off halfway through, I want to give you the take-home point now. And it's that line along the bottom. It says, Jesus is our soon-coming king. And if nothing else today, I want you to remember this. If nothing else from these series we've been looking at, I want you to take home those little statements. Now again, please note this is a massive topic. We're just going to scrape the surface. But I hope it's enough to kind of just stir a curiosity within you to go home and to dig into it more yourself. But if you happen to have any more questions, feel free to have a chat later or have a chat to one of our elders. But let's dig in. Who here listens to the news? Yeah? Who likes to listen to the news? You know, I've got to admit, like one of the first things I do in the morning is to read the New Zealand news. 
Um, I said that, that one in. But it has world news and everything in it as well. But I like to find out what's going on around the world. It keeps you in kind of in the loop with what's going on, things that are taking place. But I've got to be honest, sometimes it's kind of scary when you're opening up that internet page or you're asking Google Home to tell you what the latest news is. Because you're never really too sure what you're going to hear. It's not always just the rosy stuff. A lot of the time, the media presents stories that are going to obviously sell them. So going to actually give them some money. The world is going crazy. There's wars starting here. There's things going on all over the place. And I'm not really going to even start to talk about what's been going on this last week. But the world is falling apart. As I was doing some research for the sermon, I found some interesting statistics. I don't know if anyone else likes to look at statistics and kind of the numbers, but here's a few for you. According to the NASA stats on international disaster charter activations, and that's ones that you have to have global impact enough to actually report them, and these are the ones that we've had just in the last two months. We've had flooding in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Armenia, Colombia, Russia, Uruguay, Argentina, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Dominican Republic, Brazil, and Kenya. And that's just in the last two months. If you go back further, you've had massive storms in all, all places, Dubai. Also this year, we've had an earthquake in Japan, the landslip in PNG, wildfires in Chile, Guatemala, severe storms in the UAE and South Africa, cyclones in Madagascar and Bangladesh, as well as an oil spill in Trinidad and Tobago. Those are things that are making the world headlines. It's not exactly happy news. What about closer to home? Now, living here in Queensland, we all know about the natural disasters. We all know about the wildfires. We all know about the floods. I'm not going to talk about that. But what about the things that we don't like to talk about? The things where we as humans do things to other humans. What about crime? According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, here's the stats for 2023. Across our country, there were 409 victims of homicide and related offences. This was an increase of 5% from 2022. This equates to about two in every 100,000 people. Now that may seem like not that very significant, but that's a large deal. That's pretty severe. Sexual assault was also up by 11% last year, the highest rate ever recorded in the time series. There were 501 victims of abduction or kidnapping. There was an increase of 56% of victims of blackmail and exhaustion from the previous year. The number of victims of unlawful entry with intent increased by 6%. There was also an increase of 10% of motor vehicle theft from 2022 and Queensland was one of the worst states. This is also the highest number of victims since 2008. And the list goes on. If you have a look through that, there's number after number where it's not getting any better. Whenever I stop and look around, if that's what you're focusing on, I see trouble everywhere. I get this feeling that this is not going to end well if that's what we're focusing on. If the world keeps going the way that it is, it's going to implode. It cannot keep going for much longer. Something is going to happen. So it raises the question, what will happen? How will the world end? Philip Adams once wrote an interesting article entitled, It's Apocalypse Now, But How? In the Weekend in Review. And in this, he presented, he presented 10 different... Give that a try. He presented 10 different scenarios from the great thinkers around the world of how the world is going to end. Has anyone read that article? It was pretty popular a few years back. So scenario number one, and again, this isn't the prettiest one, but 
It's going to be a terrorist, sorry, a terrorist nuclear or biological attack. Number two, according to this scenario, super germs are going to wipe us out. Scenario three, this one is the enlargening hole of the ozone layer, especially down here in the southern hemisphere. It's not getting any better. Number four, this concerned oxygen depletion, stating that we are all going to asphyxiate. Sorry. Number five, asteroids will do the job, either by squishing us or by creating a tidal wave, as some believe has happened in the past. Option six is by genetic bioengineering. Our biological tinkering with the genome will eventually be our undoing. Option seven, this option suggests that religious extremists would do the job, and we have had a few of those. Option eight, social disintegration and ethnic cleansing. We've seen previously in the Holocaust, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Serbia, and Croatia. Option nine, overpopulation. With too many mouths to feed, eventually we're just going to run out of food. And lastly, option 10, starvation by water depletion. And living in Australia, it's definitely believable. At the end of the article, as he's finishing off after describing these 10 different world-ending scenarios in detail, he ends with the words, have a nice day. Like, seriously, if you read through that article, you read what the great minds of the world think is going to happen, how are you going to have a nice day? Because the future looks pretty bleak. It looks pretty depressing. There's no hope. There's nothing to look forward to. If that is all you have, it's not a happy ending. So it brings me to what I'd like to present to you today as an 11th option. And it's one that we find in the Bible that rings loud and clear. It's an 11th scenario that Adams did not see and does not want to believe. It's the return of our soon coming king. And from the Bible, we get this picture of this bringing about the end of the world as we know it. There's a great significance in this. The return of Jesus as our soon coming king is central to our faith. It is this hope that keeps us going on. It has kept countless generations faithful. It keeps us focused on our ultimate destination, the assurance that this is not it. But another key to this belief is that it is not just something that affects our future. It's not just something that we focus on and look forward to. But in knowing that we have our king returning soon, it should impact the way we live now. It should impact us because we know that time is running out. We know that we have friends and family who do not yet know Jesus, who aren't yet ready for his return. And so it should impact us to share the gospel with all we come in contact with. In knowing that Jesus is returning soon, we are or we should be motivated to live righteously and to share the gospel with urgency. We find this hope and assurance in the words of Jesus as he spoke to the disciples. And if you've got your Bibles, please turn them with me to John chapter 14, 1 to 3. It's a well-known passage, but it's always good to open the word. John chapter 14, 1 to 3. John 14, 1 to 3 reads, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. Imagine the anguish that Jesus is feeling as he's saying these words. He's there at the Last Supper. He knows what he is about to go through as he's brought before the priests, as he's brought before Pilate, as he's dragged out and hung up on the cross. He knows the anguish that he's going to go through as he experiences separation from the Father for the very first time in eternity. 
And yet, even in that moment, he looks out around the table and he sees the faces of his disciples, of his followers. He sees the anguish that they are going to go through in the next few days as they mourn the loss of their teacher, of their friend, of their Messiah. But even greater than that, he knows what they're going to go through when he returns to his father. The pain that they are going to face, the ultimate end to their lives. He knows the anguish that his followers will face right up until he returns. And so he comforts them. He tells them it's going to be okay. I've got a plan. Although I may be gone for a while, I will come back. I'm gone for a reason. I'm preparing a place for you. I want to make it just perfect. And when it's ready, I'm going to come back and take you and everyone who has ever believed in me to come back and live with us once again. I don't know about you, but I've always had, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. A bit of a, a love-hate relationship with the airports. Anyone else kind of experience that? It's always exciting when you're going to the airport to go traveling yourself, go off on an adventure, enjoy something new. It's just not so exciting when you're going to drop off family members, dropping off friends. Growing up in New Zealand and then Fiji and then get Avondale and here in Australia, I've had a lot of those different experiences. People coming, people leaving, going on different trips yourself. That anticipation, that joy, that excitement of when they're going to come. And that joy of the reunion when it takes place. Even more recently during COVID, it was awesome when finally we were able to have my dad come back and visit us a couple of years back. After being a stuck out with all the borders closed for two years. It was great because the kids had grown up a lot and would added Zaid to the mix. And it was amazing, that first experience at the airport. The anticipation, the waiting, and then the joyful reunion when he walked through the gate. To me, this experience is a small little image of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. That anticipation of someone coming through that gate that you love. That joy knowing you're going to be able to experience and make some amazing memories. That's the joy we have for family and friends. How much more so for our soon coming king? What a day that was going to be. The Bible confirms for us time and time again that this event will take place. This is not just something that we're taking from one or two verses. This isn't something that we have to read between the lines to say, well, possibly Jesus may come back. This is something that reads loud and clear. Our next passage that confirms this is in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Again, they're standing up on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is about to leave. And he says, after saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching. They could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into the heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood amongst them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. So here Jesus ascends to the sky. And as he does so, we see the angels come to reassure the disciples. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he was always pointing forward to this moment. He kept trying to encourage the disciples, saying, it's okay. This is going to take place, but don't be afraid. This has to happen in order for the great return to take place. The angels tell them that the same Jesus who went up before their eyes will return in the same way, in the physical body that he ascended. They encourage the disciples not to live in fear, but rather 
with expectation. They should be assured that this event would take place. We should also be encouraged as much as the disciples were. What the angels said to the disciples is also what they say to us. To live with that same expectation, the same anticipation, assurance of his return. But also to live with the same readiness that they live with. Coming from a missionary home as a kid, I grew up hearing of stories of people all around the world sharing the good news, doing all they could to tell others about who God was. I loved, as a kid, reading about Christians down through the ages who had given everything right up to their lives. They had faced all kinds of tough situations and yet not given up their faith. From the disciples to the great reformers, all the way down to just your average day-to-day Christian. Many lost their lives staying true to their faith in Christ. But how? Why? If this was all a lie, why would they give up their lives? It raises an important question. What can sustain someone to go through everything that people have been through in the past? It can't just be blind faith. It can't just be blind hope. I hope he's going to return. I think maybe there's a 10% chance he might come back. Right down through the ages, time and time again, from Christian to Christian, they have held onto the promise of Jesus returning. And it is that guaranteed hope and assurance that has sustained believers right down the ages. There's numerous books, stories, and articles of Christian martyrs who have given all in the hope of the second coming. For believers, the promise of the second coming provides us comfort and hope. It reminds us that no matter how difficult it might get here on earth, no matter what struggles we might face, this is not it. This is not all that we are guaranteed for. No matter how hard it might get here on this earth, there's something greater still to come. This sin-ravaged world is not our final home. We have a glorious future to look forward to. And the hope of that greater place to come can help you get through so much. It's something that keeps me going. That hope that we will have no more sin, no more suffering, no more goodbyes. And that hope is not just a distant dream. It's not just something you hold on to in case, but it also is a present reality that strengthens our faith, that strengthens our resolve. So let's dig into this hope by looking at the return. Let's start by looking at the signs, and again, these are things that we know pretty well. But if you've got your Bibles, please open them with me to Matthew chapter 4. Sorry, Matthew 24, and we're going to read from verse 4. Matthew 24 from verse 4. Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming that I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of birth pains, with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. So there's a number of signs that we actually see there. 
Firstly, we see false prophets. Jesus warns that there will be people who come, some claiming to be the Messiah, some claiming you need to follow this way, you need to do this, you need to go there. The key with this one is we need to know the truth. We need to know the word of God. So that way we are not swayed. Secondly, he warns there will be wars and rumors of wars. And while conflict and turmoil are signs, these are not things that we should try and encourage. But rather they are reminders that we need peace, that we need reconciliation, and that that is only found in Christ. Thirdly, he tells there will be famines and earthquakes. These natural disasters point out the fragility of life. The fact that we need divine intervention. And the last sign he gives us is of persecution. Matthew 5.10 tells us, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Endurance is a hallmark of faith. Here we see Jesus outlining the signs of his coming. Again, these do not dictate exactly when he will return. These don't tell us he's going to come back on this date at this time in this way. But these tell us that his return is soon. They're warning signs when you see the leaves turning orange on a tree, not so much in Queensland, but elsewhere, you know that winter is coming. It's a sign of what is about to take place. But also what is important to note here is that all of those signs have been happening since Jesus was around. That's a big thing. All of those signs have already taken place. Jesus said all these things would come to be, but the end is not yet. And the big thing for me in this passage is that we read in verse 14. What happens just before the end comes? What happens? The gospel goes out to all the world. And then the end comes. The end isn't brought on by wars. The end isn't brought on by politicians. The end isn't brought on by famines and earthquakes. The end is brought on by everyone having an opportunity to tell if Jesus is who he says he is. That's a big thing. And we are living in a day like never before where people have the opportunity to hear the gospel. With the use of technology, the gospel is spreading faster than ever before to every part of the world. We truly are living in the earth's final moments. Our next passage is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And here we find Paul describing not what... Not what's taking place in the natural world around us, but what's going on in the hearts and minds of the people. Paul says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject a power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Does that picture you get sound familiar? Does it sound like the people in the world today? The challenge, though, for us when we read this passage, can we go to the next slide, please? Is that we need to be maintaining our own Christian integrity. Because sadly, the list that we read sometimes is more prevalent in the church than it is outside the church. And it's not a good thing, it's not a good look for God when people are more kind and loving outside of our doors than we are. We need to ensure that the attitudes that we have aren't reflected in that passage. 
We need to always be applying what we read, reflecting. Am I ensuring that I'm living like Christ? Am I showing kindness and love to the people around me? As we were having a look at in the adult Sabbath school this morning, some of the controversies in Mark, the way that Jesus came in and shifted the focus. Are we so caught up like the Pharisees on maintaining the law that we forget to look at the people around us who so desperately need Christ? We need to always be having a willingness to repent and to make changes when needed. We need to be able to look at ourselves to answer honestly. Are we living lives that reflect Christ's holiness and his love? And looking at these signs, we see many of them taking place right now. Current events line up perfectly with biblical prophecy, and we can show that time and time again. Natural disasters, moral decay, global unrest, they all point to the fulfillment of Jesus' words. And as we had a look at the beginning of the sermon, the natural disasters, the social and moral issues, it's going on. Just turn on the news. But it's important here, though, because it's so easy for us to get caught up in this thing called sensationalism, where we look at all these stories and we use all these stories to just stir up emotion, to stir up anticipation, to stir up people who to get scared to come in for fear or something else. And sensationalism, unfortunately, is something that is used right around the world where stories are used to provoke interest and excitement, but often at the expense of accuracy. It plays on the emotion and is used to manipulate people, while often ignoring the full truth. We need to continue to come back to the Word, come back to the Bible, come back to the Jesus that is so plainly spoken of in the Word. We must stay grounded in the Scripture and not be swayed by every claim. So then how will our king return? The first thing we see is that it will be visible and audible. It's not going to be something where you fall asleep one night and then you wake up in the morning and you're like, ah, why is my family not here? Why is my neighbors not here? Ah, They've gone somewhere. But it's all good. I had a good sleep. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. And it tells us loud and clearly what will take place. Revelation 1, verse 7. John Hare says, Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. This passage tells us plainly that when he returns, every I will see him. It's not going to be something that you can miss. It's not going to be something that because you're on the other side of the earth, somehow you miss it. The awesome thing is, I'm not sure how God's going to do it, but every eye on the earth at that moment will see him returning in the clouds. That's going to be an amazing thing. It's going to be visible. His coming will be evident to everyone. Our next passage is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. His coming will be audible. It will be announced with the loud command, with the trumpet call of God. Have you ever heard a trumpet before? You know, trumpets down through the ages have been used in cities, out on the battlefields, to let people know that something's taking place, to let people know what's going on. Why? Because they can be heard from a long way away. This again emphasizes the unmissable event that's going to happen when Jesus returns. It's not something that you're going to sleep through or miss. And as this passage said, the graves of those who have died believing in Jesus, will open up. I don't know about you, but if the ground starts moving next to you and you've got someone that comes out of the ground, you're not going to miss that kind of event. 
And then we who are still alive, who have believed in Jesus, will meet with them in the air. The next thing we see about his return is that it will be glorious and triumphant. Revelation 19, 11 to 16 tells us this amazing event. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Here we go. Next one, please. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the Lord God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The picture that we get from that passage is Jesus not coming back as a sacrificial lamb, but he's coming back as our glorious, victorious king. He will return to establish his kingdom. And this is only possible because of what he did as the sacrificial lamb. It's only possible because he lived the perfect life. Because he died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he rose again to ensure the grave holds no victory. His victory gives us hope. No matter what struggles you may be going through right now, no matter how difficult life may be, there's something greater still to come. Jesus assures you of a future with him. We also see that it is going to be unexpected yet anticipated. <coughs> In Matthew 24, 36 to 44, I'm not going to read it, but we know it's a well-known passage. If you want to read it yourself, feel free to later. But it talks here about no one knowing the day or the hour. And that is important. Because if someone tells you Jesus is returning on this day, I can tell you right now, don't listen to a word they have to say. Because the Bible is very clear on this. We do not know. But there's also something else in that passage that's also pretty clear. It tells us that it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. People eating and drinking and living their day-to-day -day lives as if it was nothing out of the ordinary. Now this is a picture that we don't often look at. A lot of the time when we look at the end times, we kind of picture the apocalypse. We picture burning, it's like buildings that are burning and everything just going out of control. But the picture that Jesus gives us here in Matthew 24 is it will be an ordinary day. It will be unexpected, yet for those who are aware, it will be anticipated. And this is where the challenge comes into this passage. Therefore, keep watch. Therefore, always be ready for you do not know when he will return. We are called to be watchful and ready for the soon return of our king. Are we constantly ensuring that our connection with our king is right? Are we spending time in his word daily to get to know him? Are we spending time in prayer with him consistently, continuously? Are we listening for his guidance in all that we do? Are we living every day as if this is the day that our king will return? <clears throat> Having assurance of the future with our king, it should impact our every day. We have assurance that this isn't all that we're made to experience. Our king is going to return and reign with us soon. 1 Corinthians 15 highlights this fact where Paul encourages us with these words. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will all be changed. Everyone, those who have died believing in him, those who are still living believing in him, 
will experience this transformation from mortal to immortal, from a body impacted by sin to how it was meant to be, all as a gift from our King. And this transformation is a similar kind of experience to something becoming what it is made to be, like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It still maintains the essence of who it was. We don't lose who we are now, but we are made perfect by the grace of God. Paul emphasizes this change in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, where he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And as we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. We are not citizens of this earth. This is not our home. Can I go next slide, please, sir? We belong to a much better place. We belong to a much better home. And we have the assurance that we will be returning there one day very soon. Our king will come back for us. And when he comes back, we'll be made like his glorious body which will then be free from pain and suffering and all the difficulties that we're going through right now. This is something that we can look forward to with assurance. And this is awesome. But it does raise a bit of a question because sadly there's also a picture given of those who don't accept the gift that Jesus offers. And we're told that when Jesus returns at that moment, those that haven't accepted him will call for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. They will be left hopeless. They will be left without a future. And I don't know about you, but I don't want any of my friends or family or anyone that I come in contact with to be in that group. We have good news. We need to share that. What's important in this picture is that right now, it's not too late. If you haven't accepted Christ and what he's done for you, do it now. Today is the day of salvation. But this topic raises another important question as we've looked at a little bit already. If we're living in the last days now and our king is about to return, how should we live now? If you've got your Bibles, I really want you to open this one with me. Turn with me right down near the end, 2 Peter chapter 3. And Peter says some pretty potent words here. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So we are called to live holy and godly lives. In other words, we are called to reflect our Savior. And the only way that we can reflect Him is by spending time with Him, by connecting with Him daily. Whoever you hang out with, you then become like. You act like them. You talk like them. The easiest way to reflect Christ is to spend time with Him. As I said before, our lives should reflect the fact that our king is returning soon. The last passage I want to refer to is another well-known one. And I'm not going to read it, but it's found in Matthew 24. So Matthew 25, 1 to 13. And it's the parable of the 10 young ladies. It's again a well-known one. And it emphasizes being prepared. All the ladies started. They were ready They anticipated the bridegroom to come. They had oil. They had lights. 
But they didn't expect the long way. They weren't ready for the long haul. And they lost the Holy Spirit along the way. Some weren't prepared for the long way. This parable reminds us that we need to keep our connection with God strong every day. We need to be daily asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can help us through this crazy world that can keep our eyes focused on Christ. There was a little girl who was lost in the city and she began to cry. A policeman came to her and asked her what the problem was. And she replied, I'm lost, Mr. Policeman. I, I, I don't know how to get home. This was back in the day where the kids could just walk anywhere and it wasn't too bad. And he asked her what her name was. And she replied, oh, well, Sue. Okay, well, well what's, what's your daddy's name? Well, um, mummy calls him Dare. Okay, well, let's, let's try something else then. What's... What's your mummy's name? Oh, well, well, daddy calls him honey, so he calls her honey. So the police officer's like, well, well, well how, how do I get around this one? Okay, so let's think about where your home is. Is there some item or some object or some natural thing that you remember that can help us get you home? And she said, yes, Mr. Policeman. Near my church, there is a big church. So near my home, sorry, there's a big church. And up on top of the big church is a big cross. If you can get me to the cross, I can find my way home. I don't know about you, but it's the same for me. If you can get to the cross, you can find your way home. The same Jesus who was coming for his friends, is the same Jesus who laid down his life, who gave it so that we could have what he deserved. He's calling us to come to the cross just as we are. To come and to accept what he's done for us. To make that decision now. Our king is returning soon. Are we ready? People are longing for the hope and assurance that we have. Are we sharing the gospel? Are we sharing the good news? I pray that every day we live out our faith until our King returns.